Welcome back to 10, 10, 10. Today, we're looking at the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. God is anti-adultery. You shall not commit adultery, period. We are commanded to honor our marriage partner. God commands us to sanctify sex because he values it so highly. It is a good gift from our gracious God. We are not to disdain it as something of little worth. From the very beginning of creation, to commit adultery was to violate the sanctity of sex in marriage. And the sanctity of sex in marriage clearly also calls for the sanctity of sex before marriage. Our culture, by contrast, is lying to us. Our culture does not value sex. It thinks of it as very common. So common that virtual strangers will share life's most intimate treasure. How hard it is to stand against the flood of cultural and peer pressure. God made our physical bodies and in Jesus, he wore one himself. God is pro-sex. He made our sex organs and gave us hormones. Humans are unique as a species in that relationship, not reproduction, lies at the heart of the sexual act. Because God created sex, he is in favor of it. It was a part of his original purpose and not an afterthought. Genesis chapter 2 shows us that men and women were created for companionship. He brought them together. We are therefore, by God's design, sexual. Our sexuality, although twisted by our rebellion against God, is good and is one of his gifts. But to say that God is pro-sex is not the same as saying that he is in favor of all sexual activity. The thrust of the seventh commandment and the whole Bible is that there is only one divinely approved context for sex, and that is inside the secure framework of a marriage comprised of one woman and one man. Faithful, monogamous, heterosexual covenant marriage is God-designed, and sex is designed for marriage. All research shows that couples who cohabit before marriage have a higher rate of divorce than those who do not. To put it bluntly, it seems that those who sleep around before marriage are likely to do so afterwards. Sex is incredibly powerful, both for good and for bad, because sex can be destructive if it is misused. Marriage also provides the only safe place for sex. Sex is so much more than intercourse. Nowhere is a, per- is a person more vulnerable than naked in bed. It requires confidence and loyalty, and it takes time. Only within the secure confines of a covenant relationship, where we are protected by security, love, and commitment, can the power of sex be unleashed. That is why the Bible says that sex outside marriage is always seen to be dangerous. There is no part of our existence where the lies are bigger, more widespread, or more seductive than the area of sex. We need to be honest and think hard in order to challenge today's sexual myths. Never ever say, as you hear a scandal in the news, it can't happen to me. Our sexuality is such a powerful force that it is capable of of tripping up presidents, prime ministers, politicians, princesses, and pastors. A few moments of sexual gratification can lead to a lifetime of guilt, a wrecked home, and a shattered family. We need to see through the lies of our society and not be persuaded by the soft words. The media, your colleagues and friends might call it a fling, a bit of a romp, a a harmless bit of fun, an affair, or even a romance. We should call it what it really is, immorality or adultery. Remember that just like all the other idols, sex promises what it cannot deliver. If you're a teenager, sex promises maturity and fulfillment. 
If you're lonely, sex promises intimacy and companionship. If you are bored, sex promises excitement. If you're hurt, sex promises comfort. If you're insecure, sex promises affirmation. But outside the context of marriage, it delivers none of those things. It only gives guilt, emptiness, and deeper hurts and regrets, which are often experienced years later. And we need to be aware that there is more to adultery than the physical act of sex because marriage is founded on more than physical relations. Marriage is an all-embracing covenant arrangement where both parties commit themselves to each other for life and give each other everything they are, sexually, psychologically, and socially. When viewed in this light, the horror of adultery becomes plain. We need to constantly remind ourselves of how serious, destructive, and costly an act of adultery is. Adultery is terrible because it is a betrayal, not only of an oath, but also of a person. It is full of lies, deceit, and cheating. This is why the innocent person's response is, how could you do this to me, to us? That is the agony. Adultery smashes the deepest, the most intimate levels of trust. It shatters the covenant promises and breaks down the walls of privacy and exclusivity that protects the heart of marriage. It is, in short, an abomination. Our society is paying a very high price for ignoring the seventh commandment and glamorizing and celebrating the sexual act at the expense of relationships. Being practical, if you are involved in an adulterous relationship, end it now. Not tomorrow, not next week, now. Pick up the telephone and do it. There is no easy way out, and yes, someone is always going to get hurt, but the only way to end it is to end it. You need to take drastic action. Where there has been adultery, you and your marriage partner will probably need to see a Christian counsellor who is able to help you work through the issues of broken trust and violation. It is very delicate and painful, and it needs to be done with God's help in the context of repentance and forgiveness. These things are not unforgivable. In the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ can set you free. With our loving, caring God, the door for repentance is always open and the healing of a marriage can happen. Whether you are single or married, you might be thinking, well, I've never actually committed adultery, so how does this relate to me? Jesus applied the seventh commandment to our thought lives. Matthew 5, 28, Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What Jesus was doing was shifting the emphasis from the action back to the desire. Clean hands are not enough. We need clean hearts. Jesus said that the look of lust or desire is also adultery. He didn't say that the look is equally as bad as the physical act, but he did say that it still counts as adultery. I read about a man who just committed adultery. I don't know what happened. The man protested in bewilderment to his minister. The minister turned to him and said, I do. Had you ever committed the act in your mind with this woman? Of course he had. And his actions had finally followed his thoughts. The battle for purity is fought in the mind. Jesus is not condemning the appreciation of pretty girls or handsome boys. It is not the first look, but the second and the third looks. Be careful what you fill your minds with. Pornography, books, magazines, movies, internet. Choose to avoid those lies and save your marriage or, if you are single, your future marriage. Marriage is built on the foundations of mutual respect <laughs> because the alternative is contempt. 
And where there is contempt, eventually there is the dangerous statement made when looking longingly uh, into someone else's eyes, you know, I don't get this sort of respect at home. And from there to the bedroom is a short walk. If you are not yet married, never consider marrying someone, anyone you do not thoroughly respect as a person, however good looking, charming, rich or famous they may be. And never consider marrying someone who doesn't love Jesus as much as you do. One way to keep a marriage strong is to take responsibility. This means fixing the problem, not fixing the blame. Decide to make your marriage work. Both partners have to make a firm commitment to the faithfulness, fidelity and honesty at all times. Tell yourself you're going to make it work or die trying. And reignite the romance. If there was more courting in marriage, there would be fewer marriages in court. To do this, we need God's help. And the great news is that God wants to help us. He loves us and is faithful and committed and covenanted to us. He didn't show his love by sending us a romantic poem or dropping a bunch of red roses on our doorstep. He did it through cries of agony and excruciating pain. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The only way to resist temptation to infidelity is to root our marriage or our singleness in the rich soil of God's confirming love. It is when we allow ourselves to be loved by Jesus that we are free to love like Jesus, faithfully, unconditionally, with purity and selflessness. When we choose to give all of ourselves, not for what we can gain, but for what the other person is worth, that is when we discover that the seventh commandment is for us and for our good. Take a moment. To ask the Holy Spirit to cleanse your mind of any sexually impure thoughts and ask him to forgive you. Commit your marriage or your singleness into the Father's hands and choose to trust him with all your relationships.